Welcome. Good morning. Now, aren't you glad you spent time and you just kind of took out a little portion of your beautiful day today to come and worship the risen Lord? I mean, I, I tell you what, our, our worship this morning, listening to you in the room and, and online, online audience family, I hope that you were connected as well. Gosh, man, y'all sounded great, you know, just awesome to be able to worship with you today. And, and to think about those songs, they truly reflect the season of life that we're in as we approach Easter. We think of all things right now coming to life and what a great reminder that after a season of being cooped up, locked up, shut down, challenged, all of those things, there's life when you persevere. There's life when you trust in the Lord Jesus. There's life and you overcome and we're in that season and that's why we've been talking about Bloom. I'm so thankful. Speaking of life, there's a lot going on at Calvary Baptist Church, just in case you didn't know. We handed out a family calendar a couple of weeks ago, and I hope that you've looked at it, and things are just rolling. Part of us being faithful to prepare our house, to repair our campus, and to do all of these things was that we knew there would be an end to pandemics and shutdowns, and we knew that we wanted to be ready to minister and to reach the people in this community with the message of Jesus when all things open back up. And I just am excited about all of those things right now. Let me tell you some of the cool things that are happening. Tomorrow night, you, the Calvary family, we here at Calvary, we are hosting the spring meeting of the New Orleans Baptist Association. So you as the people of God, you get to host, and if you wanna show up tomorrow night, Feel free to do that. Um, we're going to have a great time of worship. Your worship team which just did an awesome job, didn't they? Man, aren't you grateful for them? Your worship team is hosting and worshiping tomorrow night as well as we got some great program um, prepared for our pastors. We're going to be an encouragement to the Baptist churches, the pastors of our city, of our community. And you're hosting that tomorrow night. So again, if you want to come out, if not, we're going to stream it. So that's going to be something special uh, first um, for them as we do that for our Baptist Association of Churches. Um, big deal. Hey, Tuesday night we have an open house for any of you parents who are looking for a great Christian school that can wade through all the junk of the world and just teach a great education in a Christian environment. Uh, open house. We have right now over, we, have, we had 15 and then there was like a bunch that just added on. So we have a lot of families interested in Calvary Baptist School for next year. If you know somebody that's like looking for a no-nonsense, real education in a Christian way, you might want to share that. Tuesday night's our open house. Tell them to sign up. Um, just exciting things that are happening. Hey, look, we got a lot coming up. Next week, moms, dads, parents. Uh, hey, you may even want to take care of this grandparents, right? We are keeping all the kids Friday night. All the kids. From the babies all the way up through the students. We're keeping all the kids for you to have a date night, a family night, and all you got to do is sign up at the welcome desk. Now, don't all do it while I'm preaching, right? But we're doing that this Friday night. Awesome opportunity for you as families to be able to connect. And the Lord is really at work because Parents' Night this Friday night actually kicks off Disciple Now Weekend. Disciple Now Weekend is something for our students, another life-giving event. And we're going full force this year. So if you haven't signed up your teenager or you're looking to connect your teenager to Christ or to some new relationships, again, you can sign them up at the welcome desk. And that's just the beginning. We're in the Easter season. We have an Easter challenge that you're going to hear about next week. What, what can you do to prepare your heart for the resurrection Sunday of Jesus? What can you do to grow in your faith? We're going to give you something next week to help you bloom. I'm excited about handing that out. We roll through Easter. And then we've got a lot coming up. We've got your worship team leading worship in downtown Gretna on April 9th. That's what they're going to be doing uh, on April 9th. We got a family day coming up here for all of us to celebrate with our family and friends April the 9th. Look, we're ready. The question is, are you? Are you ready to move out of the funk? Are you ready to move out of what's captured you? and to re-engage with your church and with your faith. Today, as we look at what the last part of chapter 5, what 1 Peter, that letter says to us before we jump into 2 Peter, we're going to see how we as the people of God have been called to just move forward in our faith, how we've been called 
to bloom. So I look forward to sharing that with you right now as we look and you turn in your Bibles. First Peter chapter 5. Now one of the songs they were singing as you turn there, I just wrote this down because I thought what a great statement. Hallelujah, it is finished. Hallelujah, it is done. Hallelujah, King forever. We thank you for the cross. Isn't that good? I mean, as we approach Easter, Good Friday, getting ready to take the Lord's Supper together that Good Friday evening, and as we approach Easter weekend, I'm just so grateful for Jesus and for the cross. Today, we continue and we pick up right where we left off last week, which thank the Lord for Pastor Bo for a minute, you know. He has a newborn, and yet he came prepared to preach the word last week, and I, I was blessed by that, weren't you? I'm so thankful for our, our staff team here and as we look at 1 Peter chapter 5, um, he actually begins by talking about the leaders of the church and the people of the church. Now, the reason I selected 1 Peter, I know we went through that early on in 2020 in the pandemic, but I came back to it because I thought, as you come out of a pandemic, what is it that we need to know as Christians to be a healthier, stronger church in the future? As you move forward in your faith, what are the principles that you need to know, that we need to know, to be able to strengthen our faith, to strengthen ourselves as believers, and strengthen our church to move forward? And Simon Peter wrote these letters to churches, to Christians, to teach them how to do that in the world in which he lived. And these principles are still the same today. So he writes, chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to read from the New International Version today. The Bible says this. To the elders among you, those would be the leaders in the church of that day. I appeal to you as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because... Look at this. God opposes the proud. Let me say that again. God opposes the proud. But he shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Isn't that good? Cast all your anxiety. How much? All your anxiety on him. Why? Why? Because he cares for you. Be alert and sober of mind. Your, devil, the, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you, and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. So does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love and peace to all of you who are in Christ. What great words that Simon Peter would write to the church, to Christians in his generation, Christians who were under attack, Christians who were persecuted, Christians who were persecuted not just from a government that was against them, but just in the sense that they didn't fit into the world around them. They were pursuing a higher 
calling for their lives. And today, that's what I want us to focus on, this calling toward eternal glory. I've called today's message Eternal Glory. Because Simon Peter, as he closes the first letter that he would write to the Christians, before we get into the second letter that he would write to the churches, in this chapter, he emphasizes the calling of the saints and the glory to which they attain, the eternal glory. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. And I know that if you're honest, like myself, you probably, if you could look back over the years of your life, and if you could see what the future was, was going to bring you today, would you have made a change in some of the choices and actions of your past so that you would feel different, be different, and live different in the state of your world today? Would you do that? Absolutely you would, particularly if you've suffered because of any of those choices, particularly if you're going through some challenges because of any of those choices. If you could look back, you would probably change some of the actions and the choices and the things that you've walked through to get yourself into a different position today. That's one of the benefits of being able to look back. Now, I realize that there are some of you that you are super holy. And you would look back on your life and go, I wouldn't change a thing. Or at least you wouldn't change a thing that anybody knows about. <laughs> but the reality is, if we all look back, maybe a tweak here, a different choice here, a different direction there. And I'm not diminishing how God has been faithful to get you to where you are today. Because he is faithful in all things, amen? Amen. He uses our good times, our good choices, and our bad times, and the choices that weren't so perfect, right? He uses all of that for his sanctification of his children to build us up, even through hard times, to teach us what it means to be his child, to make us more like Christ. However, if you could see the future, if you could see what God was doing, like me, perhaps you would say, you know what, that wasn't worth it. That didn't lead to where I wanted to be. That didn't get the results that I thought it would achieve. I didn't arrive at the point where I thought I would arrive. We all are going to go through moments like that. So how do you get past that and live as best as God has intended you even now in light of maybe choices like that? It's learning to live for something more than the moment. It's learning to live for something more than our circumstances or the challenges that we're going through. Even now, we have to learn to live according to the calling that God has placed on all of our lives as children and the eternal glory, the eternal glory that he has for you and for those that you would lead to Jesus in your life, the eternal glory that God has for you, when you live for something more than this world, you are guaranteed something better. And Peter talks about the eternal glory that is set up for you. He's talking about not just, hey, let's all go to heaven, because that's a great thing for those of us who trust in Jesus. That's a guaranteed. But he's talking about experiencing it even right now in the midst of whatever it is you may face. Whether it's glory in your work, glory in your home, or whether you're going through some feelings that are not so glorious. Some moments and challenges that you really do not appreciate right now. And maybe they were a result of choices, or maybe they were a result of someone else's choices. How do you move beyond that and experience God's best right now? And he begins to teach us in this passage, how to do that. Here's your life lesson. As you take notes, and I hope that you will, you'll write these down because they will help you and I as we meditate on this last chapter of First Peter. Here's the life lesson. God's children, and we've been talking about blooms, so God's children bloom. That means you. You bloom when we embrace his calling on our lives. We bloom when we embrace the calling of God on our lives. I want to share a secret with you this morning. It's not just your preacher who was called to do the work of God. You don't just pay your preacher 
to be a good preacher and a good Christian. God's calling is just as important for you. And what Simon Peter begins to do in this last chapter is help the church. And how does he help the church? First and foremost, he says, you better get some good pastors in your church. You better get some people who do it for the right reason, and that is God's glory, not their own. You better get some people who are focused on the right things according to his word and according to the needs of the church, and that's who you do it. Then he begins to talk about, okay, what about then the membership? And this chapter is very important because he talks about the leadership, and then he talks about the followers of Jesus in the church. And he begins to say, hey, guess what? It's not just about the preachers, it's about the people. And then he begins to talk about how the people can respond. And then he talks about the results. When the church of God gets lined up and moving in the right direction, he talks about what can happen. So let's break that down as we think about how we can bloom by embracing God's calling on our lives. In the first part of this passage, he talks about the church, the Christians, the family of believers. He calls it the family of believers. And we identify ourselves here at Calvary as the family of faith. We are a part of who Peter was talking to. And he says to the family of, of believers, they are people who, in the family of believers, people who bloom, they are people who lead and serve with humility. The people in the church, in the family of Christ, they are people who lead and who serve with humility. He talks both to the leaders and he talks to the church, the body of Christ, the believers. And he says, for all of us, there is a moment of leadership and there's a moment of service. In our lives as Christians, I think one of the great challenges for the Christians of today is that as we look at the churches, what seems to happen so many times is most churches want to recruit the best, most talented, gifted pastor to come be their pastor so that they can say they have the best, most talented, gifted pastor and they don't have to do anything. This week, I had the joy of being here on campus with one of my mentors, pastor in my life, and we were catching up on how to continue to move this church forward and, and look ahead for what God would have for you, the people of Calvary. And we returned from a lunch, and there were some people here doing a tour with Pastor Stephen, our children's pastor. They came to church here when they were children. This gentleman was telling me, hey, I was here nine. His sister was with him. She was, he said, you know, she was here when she was 11 and our family was here and they were with someone else. They were actually talking about being on staff as the youth pastor for Dr. Hiram Campbell. I was like, man, that was a long time ago, you know, great man, great pastor. And they were like, yeah, you should have worked with him. I was like, no, I, I still do. I still think the world of him, right? And they were talking about serving with him. And they were with another couple. And I guess they were just in New Orleans to reminisce their time here at Calvary. And they served at a church in Alabama. And wouldn't you know it that while we're standing outside, they said, we're looking for a pastor. Do you have a resume? I said, you know, I really don't. <laughs> and if I did, I wouldn't give it to you. <laughs> Because you don't ask somebody, you don't come onto their home turf and ask them if they're going to do that. I, I, don't, I don't think that's even appropriate. But no, I, I told them, you know, the truth is, God has me exactly where I know I need to be. I don't need to go anywhere else. They're like, well, we're in one of the fastest growing counties in Alabama. I said, good for you. I'm right where I need to be, right? There's... There's this desire, though, because what they, what they said, and this was even funny. After they asked me that question, they turned to Pastor Stephen and said, you got a resume? I'm like, boy, you got some gall trying to, trying to ask one of my staff members if he can go. The answer is no, you know, <laughs> because we believe in what we're doing here. We believe in you. We believe in this church. It doesn't mean that a pastor doesn't ever go anywhere. But when you know you have a place and a calling, and you know that you're doing something that is beyond the human eye. 
When you're doing something for a greater reward than the accolades of men or the size of your church or congregation, you're doing something because you believe in the calling that God has placed on your life. And sometimes that is very specific to a place and a location. I wish that you as church members could even grasp the power of that because when you're called to something, the seasons can come, storms can blow up in your face, hurricanes and all that difficulty, financial lean times, times where there's surplus, times where you're on mission, times where you don't know what's happening, but you stay faithful because you know you're called by God to serve him and to serve the church where you're located. That's what Simon Peter is talking about. It's exactly how I feel about you. That's exactly how I feel about this congregation. It's why I continue. I'm coming up on 14 years. They said, you've been here a long time. Don't you think it's time to go? No. Now, y'all might think that, but I'm not. God hadn't said that to me yet, right? No. No, the reality is when you have a calling by God to do what God has asked you to do as a child of God, listen very closely, not as a preacher, but as a person, a person in your church, in the family of faith, then you step up. When other people step back, you step in. And you learn how to do that, how to lead and how to serve with humility. One of the things, I have to talk about this because Simon Peter talked about this, right? So it's kind of hard for me to talk about the pastorship, but yet in Scripture you see them talk about it quite, oft, quite often. Simon Peter's talking about the elders, and he's talking about those who lead the church. And how do you know this? In the very first verse, he says, I write this to the elders of the church, of which I am a fellow elder. Did you see that in the scripture? So in other words, Simon Peter is saying, hey, listen, to all the pastors and the leaders that are helping the church in the persecuted Roman Empire of that time, I stand with you. Kind of like what we will do tomorrow night to stand with our churches and community and to encourage them and build them up. When you lead and you serve, you do it with humility. And the staff team here, if you were to survey them, I don't even encourage you to do that. If you were to survey them all off the record, the reason you have a staff team here, by the way, that it's not the average youth pastor here 18 months and gone. Most of your staff members here are going on 10 plus years of service at Calvary. I don't know if you knew that or not. Pastor Noah is just the youngest, right? But he's just getting started. You see him leading worship. What's he do? He jumps right in. What is Pastor Noah? He's our student pastor. What do you see him doing on Sunday? Leading and serving with another gift that he's been given in worship, right? And he does that with all of his heart. There's something about leading and serving in the calling that God has given you for the church in which he's placed you that gives that church strength. It's why in the midst of a pandemic, I said, you know what, we're going to fix our house. And I do have some people that said, boy, your timing is horrible, right? Even now, inflation's through the roof, higher than it's ever been in 40 years, right? Right. We have a little bit of a debt load. We're going to talk about at one of our events coming up how we're going to solve that, right? A little bit, not a lot. We've had some lean times in our budget giving this year. January and February were interesting because we took in less than what we normally need to operate. And I'm like, all right, tighten the belt. Here we go again. Why is that? Well, I understand life is hard on you. Life is hard on those of you who are watching online. And therefore, sometimes... We step back in our leadership through our tithes and offerings. We step back in our service recognizing that volunteering and giving to the church is important. We step back when times get hard. Simon Peter says, hey, look, I'm going through it as well. And I stand with you, all of you fellow elders, step forward, don't step back. That's why as a church, we step forward in the midst of a pandemic. It's why as a church, we continue to push forward in the midst of the world reopening. We are not serving, and listen very closely, a government of this world. It doesn't matter if you call yourself Democrat, Republican, or Independent. That's not who we serve. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ, maker of heaven and earth, king of all kings, Lord of lords, who gave his life for the church. 
for you. And based in that faith, when we lead right and we serve right with humility right, you're going to get the right results. And that's what Peter writes in this last chapter. He says, look, this is the result of what's going to happen when you lead well and you serve well with humility. Notice how he writes this. I am a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings. Have you suffered? Have you been through challenges in your life? This week I read an article that they have just recently added to the Diagnostic Manual of Counseling. They've just added a new psychological challenge that people go through. It's called prolonged suffering. If you have suffered in this feeling of depression, loneliness, discouragement for over a year, they just added that to the diagnostic manual that psychologists use to try to help people diagnose what they're going through. They said, if you're going through that, you probably need someone to help you. You probably need to see somebody because long-term suffering is a real thing. Now that's before Simon, they write that today. Simon Peter was writing about that before there was even a manual about it. And he said, look, we suffer together, but if we suffer together, we will also share in the glory that is to be revealed. If you suffer according to the name of Christ, church, if you suffer as you walk through, but you hold on to your truthfulness and faith in Jesus, guess what you reveal? What will be revealed? An eternal glory because you remained committed to your calling, to the one who called you. He says to them, look, shepherd the flock of God under your care. There's another passage in Scripture that says, Hey, shepherds, shepherd the flock of God, but not under compulsion. Shepherd them because you will give an account for their souls. You ever thought about that? I think about that. That I have to give an account to God for every one of you that's in this room. Or for every one of you who's been here before is watching online. Not only for my own ministry but for the people in the church. Now, I don't know that we take our calling as Christians that seriously quite often. But God says, look, that's how important it is, the calling that's on the church, the body of Christ. So pastor, leader, elder, staff members, deacons, those who love the church and give to the church, serve well, lead well. And how do you do it? With humility. Do not lord it over those entrusted to you. But be an example so that when the chief shepherd, who's the chief shepherd? Who's the chief shepherd? The chief shepherd's Jesus. He is the good shepherd. The Bible calls him that. And when the good shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. By being faithful in leadership and in service with humility to Jesus, there is a reward for us that will never fade away, a crown of eternal glory. When I look at this passage, he goes on and talks about how to clothe yourself with humility. He says, those of you who are younger, we're all younger than somebody else. Did you realize that? Those of you who are younger, we're all younger than somebody else. Matter of fact, the older you get, the younger you want to be. <laughs> The older you get, you're looking for somebody older than you so that you can say, see, I'm not that old. Yep, I'm not in that shape, right? We're all needing somebody younger. We're all younger and we're all under someone's authority. Even for myself, I'm under the authority of Jesus. I have to give an account for my leadership, good, bad, wrong, and different. I have to answer for what I've done for his body, the church. That's a responsibility that I have to face him for. But likewise, we all are under the authority of Christ and someone else's authority. And when it comes to the body of Christ, he gives a very good principle. Listen very closely. A very good principle that will help you as a church member. And quite frankly, this would help most of our churches, not only Baptist churches, but of other denominations and other churches across our nation. He gives a principle that would help us be healthy. 
Stop infighting. Stop shooting our wounded. Stop tearing down good people, leadership. Stop bickering and complaining when you don't get your way. Stop saying, oh, I love that church, but can you believe this and that and the other and doing all this gossip, poison, junk that the church does? Simon Peter says, cut that crap out. Sorry, I said that. Cut that out, right? Because the reality is that's not the body of Jesus. There is no place for that with good people and good leadership in the church. Grow up. And how do you do that? You grow down. How do you grow up? You grow down. Because then he begins to say, humble yourselves. You see, you lead and you serve Jesus and his church with humility. You serve with humility. Humble yourselves toward one another. That means you value someone else as more highly than yourself. You think about how that might affect them more so than how you feel about it. You humble yourselves toward one another because God is opposed to the proud. And one of the beautiful things about this congregation. And if you're looking for a church home and you have not joined this church in membership, I want to encourage you to do so. There's a card actually in the chair in front of you. And for those of you online, you can actually send us a note. But there's a card that has a response section. We want you to know Jesus. We want you to recommit to your faith. We want you to commit to Bible study. But step one, if you hadn't joined the church, we want you to learn about membership and what it means to be in the church. Because to be a part of the body of Christ locally, to be involved and serve in the body of Christ, means that you are actively involved in God's calling on your life to impact the world in Jesus' name. There is no greater calling on your life than to impact the world through the message of Jesus Christ to impact people eternally in Jesus' name. God is opposed to the proud. He shows favor to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. He's in charge. And what I love about this church, this church has a spirit of humility before God to serve God, to get along to focus on what matters. That is leading men and women, boys and girls to Jesus, seeing them baptized and grow in their faith. Now, every now and then, surely, I hear about a little rumbling about someone who's discontent or who didn't like something. But overall, usually the people in this church work that out according to Scripture and in faith. And if they don't, they leave. Usually that's what happens. Why? Because overall, there is a legacy, and some of you are a part of this for generations, and your family generations, you are committed to Jesus first and foremost. And then you're committed to a healthy church that knows its purpose and its mission. And you do that because you know there is something greater than even your convenience, my convenience, our convenience. You see, even now, as we look ahead... It's not convenient to think, man, let's just keep opening things up. Let's keep doing more Bible study groups. Let's launch into new ministry opportunities for families. Hey, let's think about school. It's not convenient, but it's going to happen by conviction. It happens by conviction because there's a calling. And when you have conviction and calling to commit to God's work, God's church, God's people, you don't flinch. You just keep moving ahead because you know, you know what? I'm doing something of eternal glory. I'm doing something greater than my paycheck, my retirement account, which is a lot less today, by the way, right? So if you're living for that, you better keep on living a long time because inflation is going to keep eating it up and it's going to keep getting smaller, right? Doesn't matter if there's a bull market in the future, right? There's always a bear eating your dollars. That's the way it works in this world. You better be living for something else. When you get to heaven and you face Jesus and you have to give an account just like I do before him, I hope that you along with me will say, Jesus, you put a calling on my life. And it was more than a paycheck. It was more than an audience. It was more than the size of my business. It was more than my physical health. 
Jesus, it was my faithfulness to you, your people, your church, and your mission to help people come to know about you. That's fascinating. And Simon Peter says, the church will work when you have leaders and servants who humble themselves under the mighty hand of God with a promise. And what's the promise? If you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, which is anti everything about our world. It is anti everything about every agenda out there you see. It is anti everything about my flesh and your flesh. But if as a child of God with a calling on your life and a conviction that Jesus has saved you, you're going to follow him if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, leader, servant, volunteer, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, what does he promise? He will exalt you in, right, in the right time. Jesus will exalt you. He will give you the opportunity, the platform, the moment to impact others for his kingdom. And there is an eternal reward, a crown of glory signed up for you when you humble yourself so that God may exalt you. And God has a way of exalting those who are humble before him. Isn't that who you want to be? That's the first step that he outlines for the leaders and for the followers, the members of the church of that generation. The second thing that he talks about is they are not people who only lead and serve with humility. Look at this. They are people who learn to resist the devil. Anybody need to resist the devil in their life a little bit? I mean, am I the only one that the devil messes with? I'm just curious. Devil been messing with anybody else out there? Can I get an amen on that one, right? Yeah, I mean, the reality is... The devil's messing with you. The devil's messing with this world. Turn the news on, right? The devil is messing. And how do you know the devil's messing with the world? Look at all the pride. I mean, just try to help somebody in their life see something a little different way. And what happens? They're going to blow up in your face. Talk about and disagree with somebody and what's going to happen. Boom, they're going to fight you over these things. There's wars about that in case you haven't seen that. There's all kinds of division, not just internationally, nationally. It all happens. Where do you think that comes from? We're not that smart as people. And listen, I got an advanced degree, a doctorate degree. Some of you do as well. Look, I am grateful. God made us heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's how God made us. But there's someone else working against you in your job, in your home. In your finances. He even works in the church sometimes. His name is the devil and he's good. He's been playing the game since Genesis and he's still playing it today. He's been playing it. If he knew how to deceive Adam and Eve, then guess what? As the father of deception, you and I, next target. Wow. So what are you going to do about it? You're going to stand there and take it. You're going to stand there and say, well, that's just who I am. I can't get any better. It never happens any better for me. I'm just determined to be beat down. Well, this addiction or this temptation, it's just always going to get the best of me. Not if you let it. Not if you don't want to let it. The reality is the Bible tells you and I something. And it tells us something very important about our relationship with Jesus. Listen, verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Alert means I'm paying attention on a daily basis. I'm paying attention to what's going on in my life and in my spiritual life. I'm taking care of my spiritual life, my relationship with God. Be alert and be sober-minded. What's the opposite of sober-minded? Yeah, you're, you're, you're drunk. You're inebriated with life, perhaps. You're busy. I'm not just talking about with a substance. You're busy. You're busy doing good things. Good things with your job, your children, your grandchildren. I understand that. Life is busy. But the Bible says be alert and sober-minded. It means that you're focused on what's right in front of you. You're not drifting off into some state of figment of your imagination or some reality that's not even present in the moment. It means you're right here with it. Be alert and sober-minded. Why? You have an enemy. His name is the devil. He prowls about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 
That's me. That's you. That's your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we all need to battle him by resisting him, standing firm in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the entire world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. This is a wake-up call for Christians then, but I think it's more appropriate, actually, for us today. Because I think today, when we go through something, we believe we're the only ones that it ever happened to. I'm the only one that ever felt this way. Nobody cares about how I feel. I'm the only one that's ever had this challenge happen in my life. And those feelings happen. Do you know where they come from? The devil. <laughs> because he's looking for someone to isolate. What animal in the herd does the lion attack and make its next meal? The weak and the fringe. Now here's what happens usually in people's church attendance and in their faith. Usually they're on fire for the Lord at some point in their life and Usually they want to get close to the heat. Now, y'all all don't rush to sit up front next week, right? But usually they want to sit close to the heat. They're eager. They're in Bible study. They're, they're looking for the next church thing to happen. And then they kind of cool off a little bit. Then they, man, they listen to somebody's gossip. They get their feelings hurt, whatever. And they, they hear some anti-church person on the news or they read some anti-church article instead of reading their Bible in Jesus' name. And they read that and then they make that their little axe to grind, you know, thing they focus on. And then they start moving back in the seats in the church. And then eventually what I always notice as a pastor, think a pastor doesn't pay, pay attention. <laughs> what I always notice is eventually they're sitting on the back row. Now I'm not picking on y'all on the back row today. I love you in Jesus name and I know you and I'm so grateful for you, right? But usually they move a little further back and then you know where the next place is after the back row? Out the door. And then if I ever see them three, four, five, six, ten 10 years later, 14 years later, still hadn't seen some of you. So maybe it's time for you to get right with God and get back in church, right? But usually what happens is they've moved to the fringe of the herd. And when you're weak in your faith, you're not walking with the Lord Jesus, not committed to prayer, active in scripture, in community, in the safety of the herd, studying the word of God, then you're on your own. And the lion is the king of devouring the animals in the wild that are weak and are on their own. Likewise, Simon Peter gives this analogy to you and I as members of the body of Christ. The devil is a roaring lion. And you don't pet a lion. You get away from a lion. You don't play with a lion. He is a roaring lion and he's not wanting to lick you like a kitty cat. He is looking for those who are weak in their faith and on the fringe of community and not connected to the body of Christ to devour. And it's happening to all of the family believers around the world. It's not just you. It's not just me. It's not just the church down the street. It's every person in the body of Christ. And therefore, we need one another. Not tearing one another down. Not belittling Christians who are growing in their faith. Not putting aside gathering in community and in Bible study groups and for prayer and for discipleship and getting your children into church and your grandchildren into church and your students into church and praying for those who are out of church. We need one another because we have to resist the devil standing firm in our faith. Do you realize that if you go to the gym... You get stronger. If you go to the church, you get stronger. 
if you go to the Word of God, to Bible study. Ladies, for some of our ladies' Bible studies that are online and coming back online. Men, the same for you. When our men gather on Saturday morning for Bible study, which I'm leading on April the 9th, when you come to that moment and you gather with men in the faith, you grow in the faith. You get stronger in your faith. You're supported. Couples, connecting in couples group. Singles, connecting in a Bible study. Being a part of community in the herd of faith allows you to stand strong against the devil. And here's a beautiful thing. There are some of you who will say honestly in your faith, I used to struggle with this. I used to bow down to this temptation. This used to rule my life. The devil had a field day on the playground of my life. But no more. I used to be, but no more. And you will say that alcohol, you don't own me anymore. Lust, temptation, you don't own me anymore. Bad relationships, you don't own me anymore. Things that have taken me out of God's word, my schedule, you don't own me anymore. I resist the devil. I will grow in my faith. And I will become stronger as a part of the body, the herd of Jesus Christ. And I will stand up against you. There are some of you that know what I'm talking about. And there are some of you who are still on the fringes and it's time to get a little bit more into the interior of the body of Christ so that the devil can stop gnawing on your life. Amen? Amen? The Bible says resist him. Stand in the faith. Stand firm in the faith because others are going through it. And then he says this, and this I will close. They are not people only who lead and serve with humility. People who learn to resist the devil. Notice I said learn to resist him. And they are also third and finally people who are called to eternal glory. If you do these things, Simon Peter says to the church, if you do these things, if you lead and serve well with humility, if you learn to stand up against the temptations, the challenges, the sufferings that the devil is going to bring in your life and in the lives of people that you love, if you will resist him by standing firm in the faith, then you are the kind of people who will experience that calling that I've been talk about, talking about. People who are called to his eternal glory. Look at this. He says, do all of these things and what's the conclusion? The God of all grace who called you. Who? You. Who's you? Me. You. Us. We. The God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory in Christ. After you have suffered a little while, he will. That's a promise. He will himself restore you. Make you strong. Make you firm and steadfast because he is the one who has the power forever and ever. And all the church said, amen. That is the promise that God gives to you and I as his believers. And Simon Peter needed to remind the church then just like we need to be reminded today. When we as the body of Christ, the people of Christ, embrace his calling on our lives, we are the kind of people who will experience the eternal glory that he talks about. Eternal glory. What does that mean? Are you going to suffer some? Yes. Am I going to suffer some? Yes. In the world, from the devil, from challenges that are natural, supernatural, some of our choosing, some of the choosing of others, it comes. But after all of that, he will restore you. Have you been through a season where the devil has stolen from you? God says, after a season of that, I will restore to you. Have you been through a season where your strength has failed you? Maybe physically, emotionally, maybe financially. It just hasn't been what you thought. The Bible says you hold fast to your faith and God will strengthen you again. He will help you to stand Firm And that word steadfast, steadfast means your feet are planted and it can push on you, but you're not going anywhere. It's kind of like when a storm comes your way, a hurricane comes your way, but your house doesn't budge. Those trees don't move. Bring the storm and I'm standing still. You're better than that. 
because you have the roots of your life planted into Christ. And when the roots of your life are planted into Christ, you will bloom. I close with this because he gives a practical example. The conclusion, by the way, of the letter, the first letter of Peter, is not there just to be looked over and go, I don't know any of those people. It doesn't mean anything. No, actually, the conclusion is very important because the conclusion might be you. It might be you. He writes this letter to Christians. He talks to the elders, the leadership, about their responsibility. He talks about us, how we battle the devil. And then he gives some examples. I want to read this. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying, this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Are you a Silas to anyone in your life? Think about that. Silas stood with Simon Peter. What was Simon Peter's next assignment? He writes this letter in 64. I've referenced this, 64 AD. And by 67 AD, tradition says he's crucified upside down by the Roman Emperor Nero. And through the midst of him going through all of that suffering, guess who was there? Silas. Silas who was saying, listen, we stand firm together. It's easier to stand firm in your faith when you have a Silas in your life. Do you have a Silas in your life? Are you a Silas to someone else in the body of Christ? When the negative voices come, when somebody who's on the out with Jesus starts sowing discord, you stand with the people that are being talked about. You stand with your friends in Jesus' name. You build up someone's faith when they're going through a hard time. Do you have a Silas? There's nothing better than a Silas in your life. Someone who is a faithful brother or a sister. Someone who will stand with you when you're going through difficult times to encourage you. And to testify into your life, the grace of God is going to save you. Stand firm and don't quit. You know what it's like to have someone in your life that will say, stand firm and don't quit. All hell can come against you. But when you have a believer in Jesus' name saying, stand firm and don't quit, you know what you're going to do? You're going to stand for him and not quit. We all need someone like that. She who is in Babylon, chosen with you, she sends you her greetings. She who is in Babylon had to be code that Simon Peter was using to not get this person of influence and power, according to the world, in trouble with the government. So he simply calls her, she who is in Babylon. Do you know that there was a church in Rome. There was a church in Rome. You read the letter of Romans that Paul wrote. He writes the letter to the church in Rome. Rome at that time was against the people of Jesus. And yet you had a church there. You had people there. And I guarantee you, you had a woman there who was making it happen in Jesus' name. Are you that kind of person? That because you stand firm, you resist the devil, you know how to serve the Lord with humility, to lead with humility. And the mission and the calling on your life is not just your job and your influence and your power in this world, but you leverage that for the kingdom of Jesus so that men and women, boys and girls can get saved, have eternal salvation and live a life that Jesus intended in this world. That's what she was doing. Simon Peter writes about it. And then he says, and so does my son Mark. So does my son, Mark. You know who he's talking about, right? Mark. John Mark. That's who he's talking about. Right now, Simon Peter has beside him, and he ultimately would return him to a guy that you name, that you know as the name, the Apostle Paul. Remember John Mark and the Apostle Paul had a falling out? And Paul said, man, you're no good. You can't help me on this. Get out of here, right? And he sends him packing on his way because he's not helping the ministry at that time. Peter takes him under his wing, nurtures him, strengthens his faith. And here in the last part of this letter, he says, and you remember that John Mark? He's useful. He's strengthened in his faith. He's grown in humility. He's resisting the devil. And you know what? He's serving the Lord and he sends you greetings as well. Now, listen, I don't know if you've ever struggled in your faith, been beat down 
had a moment that you look back and you go, I would change that, but John Mark probably would have changed that. You know what he did? He got a second chance. He received the grace of God. He had someone stand in his life, just so happened to be Peter, built him up and launched him out where he too would make a difference. That's the power of calling. That's the power of understanding how God has called us to his eternal glory to make a difference in this world. And how do you do that? With humility, standing firm in your faith against the challenges of the devil and remembering, child of God, you have been called. Called It's not just your preacher. It's you. So what are you doing with the calling of Jesus on your life? Because he's called us for way more than just this. Let's pray together. By your Holy Spirit, God, right now, we humble our hearts just as your word told us. And we humble ourselves to hear your voice. God, you have called your children to eternal glory. For some today, that means it's time for them to step into their relationship with you, Jesus. To get saved, to surrender their pride and their will, and to humble their souls before you, God, so that you would show them a glory beyond anything they've ever known, your glory and your life. Jesus, that's what you do in those who trust you. God, also for those who are walking with you today, we humble ourselves and we know that you have called us for your eternal glory. We have a calling. That calling that exists in our homes, in our jobs, in our lives, that calling is for something more than just entertainment, worldly fulfillment. That calling is a heavenly calling. Right now, for every one of your children in this room and online, Holy Spirit, I ask you to speak to each of us about the power of that calling that you have on us and how we can leverage and use what you've given us and where you've placed us very clearly Jesus for you and I pray this for your children today in that holy name above all names Jesus